Welcome. It's the private life of Peg Lynch. I'm James Lilac's online pop culture historian and other meaningless pretentious titles, and I'm here with... Astrid King, and I am Peg Lynch's daughter. And as you'll hear very shortly, you are also Peg Lynch herself. Well, I tell the story as my mother. We'll not only be telling you what Peg did after the television show and the radio show went away, we're going to be playing, of course, the little actualities, as we call them, interview snippets of Peg herself. So you'll get both Peg incarnate and Peg channeled, uh, all the Peg you need. And quite a few Peg anecdotes for which she was famous. So at this point, if you've been listening to our story over these many episodes, you know that she's risen to the top of television and radio, but then radio, through no fault of her own, came to an end. So there she is, vital, talented, willing to work, and... Trying to decide what to do with the rest of her life. And that's what we're going to tell you now. So here is the private life of Peg Lynch. I'm I'm a procrastinator, I must admit that. And I'm a deadline writer. So when I have to do something, I, I... I'm best if I'm pushed. I have to feel well. If I'm sick, then I don't give a damn. But I mean, it's... Without a deadline, I'm perfectly capable of curling up with a book or a magazine or the funny papers or all three all day. Drove my mother wild. Everyone else, I think, too. Well, after CBS canceled my radio series, The Couple Next Door, in 1960, it was after what, 758 episodes. Well, they canceled everything that wasn't news or music is about the size of it. They weren't just targeting me. But I thought, well, all right, never waste tears or time on something you can't do anything about. Doesn't get you anywhere at all. I needed to work. Well, I knew that. I had a household to support, people counting on me, mother, aunt, daughter, and odd salary. Uh, Well, my husband didn't make enough as foreign sales manager in the pulp and paper business to keep us all in the style to which we were now accustomed, or even pay the bills, to be honest. I've always been glad I married a European. I don't think an American man would have put up with his wife making more money than he did for one second, or at least put up with it gracefully. Luckily, work, once again, came to me without my having to go look for it, which, as I said, I am not very good at, especially if the new New Yorker magazine has just arrived. Well, Dr. Charlie Mayo had told me all those years ago back at the clinic in Rochester that doors would open for me, that all I had to do was walk through them, and he was right. Frankly, I wish he'd offered me some useful medical advice while I was at it, you know. uh, And remember, Peggotty, that if you're going to suck on a lifesaver every time you sit down at the typewriter, it's going to play havoc with your teeth. Oh, God, what I've gone through. I've had dentists in tears feeling so sorry for me. And the expense. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. It's just too depressing. Mr. Digit and the Battle of Bubbling Brook is an entertaining 16mm sound film in Technicolor. Done partly in cartoon animation, it tells the story of all number calling and stars the radio and television team of Ethel and Albert, starring Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce. I tell you, the nice thing about coming home from vacation is the nice big pile of mail waiting to be opened. Such fun. Now, what is this? Albert? Albert! Dear, they're going to change your telephone number. From, from, from Bubbling Brook 3, 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, seven numbers. Yeah. Oh. All numbers and no names. Yeah, I heard about that at the drugstore when I stopped in to pick up the liniment. Well, we've always been a Bubbling Brook. Always. I mean, they can't just change us to seven numbers like this. I mean, why? Sounds like a lottery ticket or convict or something. The Bell Telephone Company, AT&T, was introducing America to area codes for the first time. It was 1961. And they used us to help explain to a baffled public what in hell they were up to, along with Mr. Digit. He was a cartoon character. He was voiced by Howard McNair. It was a combination of 
animation with whatever we're called, real people. It was no small production, by the way. Animation, for one thing, costs more than just having a couple people stand in a room and talk about phone numbers. It says something about Peg's appeal, too, that AT&T chose her to explain this to America. And they used another familiar voice, Howard McNair, the man who'd played the irascible doc on Gunsmoke for decades, and he would go on to play Floyd the Barber and all the Mayberry RFD Andy Griffith shows. Bunce, he seems to be enjoying his brief appearance. He falls effortlessly back into character. He'd done a lot of commercial films on his own, so he knew this was a stopgap project for people without a steady gig. And we filmed it in L.A. I've always hated L.A., not just the traffic. I'd, I'd had some unpleasant experiences out there earlier. I think I told you about one. And I had such a terrible cold all through shooting. You can hear it in my voice. I really just wanted to get home. But I'd taken Lisa along. Sorry, Astrid. I keep forgetting to call her that. My daughter was about 10. And after filming was over, we went to Disneyland for three days. I think it only been open a few years. Well, I just loved it, despite my cold. No crowds, clean, immaculate, really, and such fun. Lisa, I think, would have been happy staying in the hotel swimming pool, but I was entranced. I remember going on the teacups, the ride, the Alice in Wonderland thing, four times in a row. I think I was the only one on it. Embarrassing my daughter, no end. I know that. I can still see her standing there, arms folded, watching me gaily sail round and round, wishing her mother would come to her senses or grow up. Lisa really takes after my mother in so many ways. Well, then not long after the Bell telephone thing, NBC called and asked me to be part of their radio monitor series, it was called, to do some Ethel and Alberts for them. Monitor was a network version of the show we'd later associate with public radio, perhaps longer form. It was aimed at an audience that wasn't changing the channel every four minutes in search of a new jolt. I think the demographic for the show skewed older. It was a more patient and involved audience. And hence, it was smart to bring back some of the old radio favorites that reminded people of the glory days. Fibber McGee and Molly, for example, did Monitor. And Ethel and Albert. It's nice to hear the old voices again. But in a way, it's admitting that they were a revival act now. Almost nostalgia. When children have a squabble, their parents should stay out of it. Did you get George on the phone? Not yet. Grace said to hold on. She's calling him. He's out in the garden. Of course, why I am calling him is beyond me. Well, you talk to him about his son. That Jimmy is a constant bully. He is always picking on Bobby. And now today to knock Bobby down and throw a stone at him, cutting this big gash in his forehead. Oh, honey, big gash. You could hardly see You it. didn't see Bobby when he came in the house with the blood streaming down his face. It came within an inch of his eye. Boys are always getting bruised and banged up. Accidents happen. It was no accident. Jimmy did it deliberately. Just as he deliberately took Bobby's scooter and broke the wheel of it, he bent the spokes of Bobby's tri sickle. He rips the covers off Bobby's books. Honey, boys will be boys. They... Well, just... Hello. Shh. Hello, George. <laughs> Hi, George. Good. What are you doing? Oh, yeah, boy, I gotta trim our hedge, too. Hey, your rock garden looks real nice. I, I... Talk to him about Jimmy now. Yeah. Uh, listen, George, about the kids. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to Ethel. Yeah. Yeah, well, Ethel thought that, well, maybe you might say something to Jimmy, you know, about the dangers of throwing stones at somebody. <laughs> huh? Hold on a minute. Did Bobby throw a stone at Jimmy first? No, he didn't throw any at all. Jimmy pushed him down for no reason, and when Bobby ran after him, Jimmy threw the stone. I asked Bobby, word of honor, I said, and he said no, and I believe him. Well, of course. George, listen, Bobby didn't throw any stones at all. Well, because we asked him and he said no. Well, certainly we believe him. Excited? Who's getting excited? Look, I, I just think I've got a right to complain when your son wallops my son over the head with a rock. <laughs> what George said? Yes, a rock. He's got a big gash on his forehead, for heaven's sakes. Just missed his eye by an eighth of an inch. Look, Bobby could have had a concussion or been blinded, for heaven's sakes. The kid will probably have an ugly scar for the rest of his life. Remind him that Jimmy's a year older. Now, look, dear, dear, year now older. look here, you know, Jimmy is a year older than Bobby. Mm -hmm. and, and, head taller, and he's yeah. a head taller. And you know as well as I do, an older boy has a tendency to bully a younger one. Yes, bully. Why? Because he does. Yeah, scooter. Mention the scooter. Huh? The scooter, scooter. Oh, Try yeah, George. The... And, you know, Jimmy took Bobby's scooter and, and, and he just... He, broke the wheel off. Just broke the wheel off deliberately. Not only that, but he is always... Uh, he bent he, the spokes on Bobby's tricycle. He bent the spokes on Bobby's tricycle. 
I'm telling you now, Jimmy is destructive. It seems to me it's time that kid learned the difference between right and wrong. Well, my son knows. What did you say? What did he say? Well, that goes for you too, pal. And another thing, I... Hello? Hello? He hung up on me. No. Well... Uh, oh, it was, uh, it was a few years later, more, I think, that I got a call from a stagehand there at NBC to say that there was a big dumpster, a garbage thing they'd parked outside behind the studios uh, in New York, and armfuls of tapes, recordings, were being heaved into it, being thrown out, you know? And he saw my monitor ones going out, and he grabbed them. So I have them, only thanks to him, really. Makes you wonder, doesn't it, what's been lost forever? It wasn't like today, you know, where you can see or hear a show again at the press of a button, well, except for me and my husband, cripes. Neither of us has a hope in hell of coming to grips with a computer when we can't even master the remote control for the TV or find the damn thing. No, back then, back then, the 1960s, once a show was gone, it was gone. Well, it's just like my kinescopes from my half hours, my Ethel and Albert live television shows, you know? I mean, it was only because I have, it was pure luck, really. I, nope, 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 no, I'm going to tell you about that later. I better stay on track here. I'm afraid I have a tendency to digress, so my daughter tells me, and everyone else. Christ, hard enough keeping things straight as you get older, isn't it, as well as hanging on to your teeth? Well, anyhow, Alan and I, Alan Bunce, uh, well, we were also very busy uh, doing spots, you know, commercials, ads. Here's something from a New York newspaper in the early 60s, quote, a great many fans of the now deceased Ethel and Albert show must have been saddened when they saw the stars Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce doing those commercials on the Sid Caesar show. Theirs was one of the best family comedies on TV, and even their commercial was funny. But somehow, they couldn't laugh. Well, it's nice to hear, but I like doing the ads. It was easier than writing and performing a half-hour comedy, for Pete's sakes. It paid well, and by this stage, they could be filmed. I mean, you know, all the ones Alan and I did back in the 50s, those live ads for television, Christ almighty what they put you through. I'm surprised we both didn't have heart attacks. I really am. We did the Babel spots, the cleanser, you know, Babel, and for, on the Jack Gleason, we didn't do it in the same uh, place. We were off in another building. And the show was raucous, and the whole day when he was on, they'd have the sound up, in our studio, so you could hardly hear yourself think. It was just deadly. And Alan and I were there all day, trying to rehearse with this racket going on, doing our lines over and over and over for this one-minute commercial, so you come out right on the nose of 59 seconds. Well, when you do something so many times, you just plain stop understanding it anymore, the words. It was pretty tricky, and also when you've done it all day long and you're tired and you're standing and you're reading the same thing you get so you don't pronounce things right. You know, you whiz, was becomes whiz, and then you don't know what the product is. Suddenly, you, know, you get ready to say it. And standing all day at this kitchen sink, and Alan had trouble with his lines, so we'd tape them inside the sink, and then he couldn't see them without his glasses. And then the babel, they would sprinkle the stuff on. It's some dirt that looks like car grease. And they would put it in and magically, well, it didn't magically wipe off. And they had to send over to a drugstore for a chemical to get the black off the sink before they could photograph it. And also, they'd never tell you when you were going to do it in the hour. And the whole the thing would just be on top volume. And then all, and you're saying to Alan, well, I just hope it... Pretty soon, then you some, see somebody go, and it's sad. Sound is off. And you give your first line. And you go, oh, boy, I always had that first line somewhere. It was really, I think they're doing the, those commercials was really the worst of anything. Then we had the ones where we did the Brooklyn gas. First, I knew that they used gas for washing machines and dryers, I guess, at any rate. I came out from lunch to find the stagehand jumping up and down on a bunch of bath towels, folded, sitting in a chair, and the bath towels around the chair. And he was stomping on them and with his bottom, you know, bump, bump, down, down like that. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, this is the pile that doesn't use the gas, and the ones that have the gas burner are the fluffy ones. 
That's crazy. That's crazy. But as I said, with film, doing ads was easier. And Al and I did some for, uh, oh, so many. I can't even think. Uh, Chemical Bank in New York, Traveler's Insurance, Cleveland Trust, Prudential, Parker Brothers, American Dairy, uh, Arnold's Bread. Oh, those spots were very well paid. I do recall that. It was only radio. But I got about $70,000 for those. Uh, I wrote them all, too, as I did most of the ads. And uh, <laughs> I just remembered something funny. Yes, I am digressing. Arnold's Bread, the Arnold Bread Company, was founded by Dean and Betty Arnold. Now, they started it in their garage, and it grew and grew and grew. And we became friends. And uh, anyhow, I was invited to be a guest of honor. It's some celebration to do the bakery in Porchester, New York. And the other guest of honor was Admiral Byrd, the explorer, who I didn't know, but who had given Dean some tips on freezing bread, which I suppose Byrd was familiar with after all his famous polar expeditions. Betty Arnold, who had a cold, didn't attend, nor did Dean, who was, believe it or not, allergic to flour. Well, just before the speeches, I noticed Admiral Byrd next to me, kind of slumping. I asked if he felt all right, and he said, no, he felt terrible, and he thought he might pass out. Well, I got someone's attention, and then the Arnold chauffeur to take Byrd back to his hotel, but he couldn't remember the name of it. Cripes, I thought, oh, God, and we ended up taking him back to Dean and Betty's house over in Mamaroneck. It was an enormous place right on Long Island Sound that used to belong to the actor Sal Mineo, if you remember him. Well, we all walked in to find Betty Arnold sitting stark naked in the grand entrance hall, balancing a martini on her head. Dean, who was under police orders not to drive ever because he was constantly getting lost and ending up in neighboring states and they kept having to go and fetch him, well, he had taken a car and he was nowhere to be found. I threw a coat over Betty, helped Bird into a guest room, went back and got Betty upstairs and into her nightgown and into bed, I had someone call the police to go look for Dean. The chauffeur concocted a sort of hot toddy for Admiral Byrd, after which he said he felt slightly better. And I sat with him while we waited for the doctor. Let's play a game, he said, while we wait. Uh, all right, I said, such as. Twenty questions, he said. I'll go first. I'm thinking of something beginning with B. Bread, I said. Yes, says Byrd. Your turn. I said, well, I'm thinking of something beginning with A. A, he said. Give me a hint. Uh, cold, I said. Ice. Penguins. Antarctica, he said. Yes, I said. <laughs> I tell you, isn't life surreal sometimes? It really is. I think he died not long after that, too. He's a nice man. He's a nice man. Well, what the hell was I talking about? Uh, Lever Brothers. Lever Brothers, that's right. Forgot those. We did a load of ads for Lever Brothers, Alan and I, Alan Bunce, for whisk detergent thing, which I swished all over our porch rug, I remember, to get rid of mildew, but didn't dilute it or whatever I was supposed to do, and I'd get a new rug, ruined the thing. Well, we filmed some of them down in New Orleans. It was fun. Ethel and Albert having lunch at the court of the two sisters in the French Quarter. restaurant, Albert. Uh-huh. Oh, look. I bet they're newlyweds. Yeah, he's got that sappy look. Oh, Albert. He's also got his elbow in the hollandaise sauce. Excuse me. Echo. Your husband has his seersucker jacket in the hollandaise sauce. Oh. Don't worry. You can clean it when you get home. How? All you need is half a cup of whisk. It's concentrated. So pour a little on the elbow and some on your husband's dirty shirt collars and pour in the whisk with the rest of the wash. That's all. Nothing else. Nope. I gave up on laundry powders. Whisk alone will wash everything spotless. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. What's the matter, Albert? You better tell her again. Why? Now he's got his other sleeve and the salad dressing. Whisk, get your whole wash spotless. I'd taken Lisa along again, and Mother this time, too. And we did all the touristy things, you know, river boat, dinners at the famous Brennan's, Commander's Palace, and so on. Well, I think Mother enjoyed herself, so it was hard to tell with her. Wherever Mother was, eating out anywhere, 
she'd always order the cheapest thing on the menu, whatever it was, you know, a, a grilled cheese sandwich or something dumb like that. And then afterwards she'd say, well, I didn't think much of the food there. New Orleans was mother's last trip, as it turned out. She sneezed in the kitchen one day and broke a rib. Cancer, gone into her bones. It had to have been agony for her, but she never complained, ever. The stoic Norwegian side of her, I guess. And being a nurse, I suppose. I suppose she knew only too well what was coming, happening, where it was all heading. She died in May of 1963 at St. Luke's Hospital in the city, New York. My Aunt Elise, mother's youngest sister, was there. Elise, the doctor, of whom, as I've mentioned, my mother was always very proud. <laughs> you know. I remember so clearly when I was a junior in high school, and they did a play when I got through, and, and I said to my mother, and I said, well, what did you think? And she said, who was the part, that boy that played, uh, 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 played Kalo for something? What was his name? My, he was good. I said, what did you think of me? You were fine. You were fine. Mm. Always afraid you are going to get a big head. Always. Oh, she was proud of me. I knew that. I hoped that. You know, that she wasn't more effusive, hasn't ruined my life or anything. You just have to laugh about it. But to her dying day, really, I don't think, in fact, I'm sure, Mother never really understood how I'd managed to get away with what I did for so long. Ironically... I don't remember now if I ever said this to her. I expect I did. I hope so. But any success I have had has been really all down to her. I once had a theme to write in the ninth grade. And I didn't know what to write about. And Mother said, well, why don't you write about how thrilled you were with your first pair of high-heeled shoes? And I thought, gee, my mother's dumb. Who'd be interested in anything as boring as that? But it got published in the school magazine, the only one that did. And, uh, well... Like Mark Twain, I decided that maybe my mother did know a thing or two. Unfortunately, you have to learn these things for yourself, don't you? I wasn't with her when she died. I was in Minnesota. An old school friend had asked me to come out, and he had some big company with a bunch of model homes opening, and I had promised I would host the event, and they were counting on me, and mother insisted I go. And as usual, when mother told me to do something, I did it. So I flew out. And my aunt, Aunt Elise, called me from the hospital that same night with the news. So there I was, in Minnesota, Rochester, the next morning, having to smile and... Meet about 2,000 people whom I knew and who knew mother. Oh, hello, how's Francis? You know, how's your mother? I had to say, fine, fine, knowing she was dead and that they'd be reading it in the paper that night. But it seemed the better part of valor. So when... Uh, oh, God, was I going to tell you? My mother said to me, being very practical, now when I die, I do not want you buying an expensive casket. You get the cheapest one they've got. So I, that, and when I called the fellow to, um, whom I vaguely knew, and um, I said, this is Peg Lynch. Hi, Peg. I saw you in the, I saw you in town. How have you been? And he's like this. And I said, well, uh, actually, Doug, um, this is sort of a business call. Oh, right away, he became the funeral director. And uh, what, what is that? Well, mother died last, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, I certainly hope you know that. As I got over at the funeral home and I, and I said, uh, what's the cheapest kid? <laughs> I'm on television doing well. And I say, what's the cheapest thing you've got from my mother? <laughs> God, and I had to laugh, so did he, and I said, well, I'll tell you something, it's not bad looking. He said, come here and I'll show it to you. And it really wasn't bad. It was pine covered with gray flannel. It looked really pretty. But I said, well, I'm not going to get it. The funeral's here. All her friends are coming. I bought the expensive white and gold one. Mother would have killed me, but at least I respected her wishes to keep the casket closed. Well, I paid for that, too. You know, then they said, no. I guess, what, was she terribly sick when she, no, she will, she looked fine, Elise said. They said she looked lovely in a blue suit and so forth, a pretty blue suit, but I, oh dear. Well, anyhow, we went to Barrier, which was in Cass in the little town nearby. 
and where she'd grown up and where I'd grown up. And uh, back in 1918, after my dad had died from the Spanish flu, mother had had her own headstone made as well, probably a cheap deal, and had been sitting there on the ground next to dad's ever since, just waiting for the date of mother's death to be added, you know, which, uh, which when I was little, I'd found uh, not so much disturbing as confusing. You know, every time we go to put flowers on my father's grave, seeing my mother's name on a stone next to his, when clearly she wasn't down there, she was standing right next to me. Well, we had the funeral. My aunts, uh, Elise and Helen, flew out, and Lisa, and afterwards... I thought, well, there's so many flowers. I'll take them around to some of the, some of the people that we knew, my neighbors, and they're all old, old ladies like I am now. And so I was trying, trying to get along. And I took the flowers to Mrs. Greenslit and the flowers to the Jansen girls. And then I went up to uh, another couple, I can't think, Beaver, Eunice Beaver. And the two sisters left. They were the kind of thing that uh, Rockwell would make fun of. They were drawing cartoon, the, you know, the tourists from, from Minnesota to come walking down Fifth Avenue with the white gloves and the straw hat and the little flowers in front, you know, and the sunburn showing on the necks of the farmers and so forth. And uh, I, uh, I walked in and I sat down. I looked at the coffee table and there was the copy of the New Yorker. I couldn't believe my eyes, and I said, and the New York Times, and I said, uh, you like the New York? Oh, love the New Yorker. It is so funny. Oh, we just couldn't do without it. And we, we, uh, we stay at the plaza every time we come to New York, and we go through, you know, on the way to Europe. And I thought, I'm brightening their lives with a touch of the city. <laughs> God, oh, I feel like a fool. But it's typical of Minnesota. It really is. People back east might think of the Midwest as Hicksville, but they do so at their peril, I tell you that. And I know that uh, theater, well, George S. Kaufman always said that Minneapolis was the hardest, the hardest city to get a good notice in with a play. Anyhow, I told them, the Beaver sisters, what I had incorrectly assumed about them. And we all laughed about it. And I said, I was brightening your lives. I think you better brighten mine and take me to Europe with you. I did go to Europe with Lisa after Mother died. We sailed over in the Oslo Fjord. Ten days it took. And Odd flew over and met the boat in Norway. And we saw all his, our family, lovely. Went on to Switzerland, Lucerne, where Odd had business. It was a, a possible new job. So we were hobnobbing with all these big wigs in the pulp and paper industry. One of whom, for some reason, decided to teach Lisa to play poker. I think with bobby pins, and she proceeded to trounce him something like 10 times in a row, age 11, and I could see he was getting slightly put out. I couldn't catch her eye to say, you know, cut it out, kid. Your father's future's at stake here. Well, Odd turned down the job in the end. Neither of us knew what the hell we'd be doing living in Switzerland. It's about the size of it. I liked the cheese and the scenery, but uh, well, I had my work, you know. Walter Hart and I my director and producer. We had two or three projects, scripts we were working on together, and Alan Bunce and I had commitments, ads I told you about, and appearances, personal appearances. <laughs> I remember we were due at some benefit thing in Brooklyn and got lost. Uh, we got lost because like all men, Alan would not ask directions. And an hour later, we were still driving around Brooklyn and we're stopped at a light and I'm yelling like a fishwife, ask somebody, can't you at least ask somebody? And he's saying, I'll find it, I'll find it. I'm not so stupid, I can't find my way around. And I'm yelling, we're so late already. And a truck driver leaned out at the light and said, Ethel and Albert, I thought so. I'd recognize that voice anytime. Just like my wife, always yap, yap, yapping. <laughs> Audiences, I know for a fact, well, many of them at least, thought Alan and I really were married in real life. There was a photograph once in some newspaper. It was a shot of Alan with his arm around Ruth, his wife, some event they'd attended, and the letters that came in, indignant, from people who thought Alan was running around with another woman. <laughs> and strangely enough, my own wife, who doesn't look like Peg at all, really, we've had people come up to us and say, oh, that's Ethel and Albert. And my wife, I said... Sorry, that's Albert, but I'm not that <laughs> really. I'm, it got a little embarrassing once in a while. It was bad enough when Peg lived in New York and I lived out in Connecticut. Uh, then when Peg uh, 
took it into her head to move to Stamford, Connecticut, where, which was my address. Then it got really got too confusing, and I finally gave up and said, all right, if they want to think we're married, why, okay. <laughs> well, what I- we were surprise guests on a panel show. And about 10 minutes before I had to leave the house, I found out they wanted us to perform a short sketch on it as well. Oh, God, I thought, no time. I had to dash one off on the plane on the way out there on paper towels from the toilet, no less, and by hand, too, cripes, with a terrible pen that bled everywhere. I'm lost without a typewriter. But it was based on a sketch called Dinner at the Paradise Room that we had done years earlier on uh, NBC's The Kate Smith Television Hour. So, uh, so at least we were familiar with it, you know. In fact, the incident had actually happened to Alan and his wife, Ruth. <laughs> that really did happen. Yeah, uh, so well, took the well package we were the going bathroom. out one night, and uh, my wife tucked the garbage, you know, she wrapped it up in a newspaper or something, and put it down in the incinerator in the hallway of the apartment house, and of course we were all, she had her purse and her gloves, and forgot that she had this under her arm. We got downtown in New York, and went into this very nice hotel, and uh, this thing started to drip, you know, and uh, she couldn't get, she took it into uh, the ladies' room and left it there, and some woman ran after her and said, Madam, you forgot your back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fun. Mm, goodness, uh, somebody left a package on this chair. Huh? No, oh, no, that's ours, darling. Now, what are you going to have? Ours? I didn't bring it. What is it? Darling, I don't know. I don't know. When we left the house, you said, pick it up. I don't even know what you're talking about. What is it? I don't know what it is. Why in the world would I tell you to pick up an old brown paper sack? Oh. <laughs> well, God, what is it? It's the garbage. <laughs> it's the what? The garbage? Oh, what, I said. what is the matter with you? Well, you, you, you told know? me to pick it up when we left the house. You said it's take not, that. I did not. Why in the I tell you to pick up an old brown sack? Why would I tell you to pick up the garbage? Oh, calm down. People are looking at us. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> in the world did I ever tell you to pick the garbage? I mean, you said pick the sack off the table when, uh, when we go downtown and package, bring it along. I said the package, oh. not the sack, the package. It was your anniversary present. I wanted you to open the it here at the table. The people at the next table are looking at us. Smile. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. Put it back on the chair. We'll take it when we leave. You can tuck it under your coat. <laughs> last that long. The bottom is already wet and getting soggy. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to walk out of the paradise room trailing coffee grounds and eggshells behind me. You said to me, pick up that... Smile. (laughs) First time in three years that we've dressed up to go out and you've got to bring along the garbage. Almost all of my shows, and by this stage I've written, oh, I don't know, thousands and thousands of scripts in various lengths, three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, half hour, and so forth, monologues. I would say almost all of my ideas have come from something that really happened to me or to Alan or to friends or to relatives. It's right and left. You know, I've come in with 100 ideas, you know, for her. I said, oh, Peg, I got a wonderful idea for you, you know. I'll start out telling you, you know, how I was going down the flight of stairs and this man came up to me and she's forgotten already what I'm saying, but I've given her another idea and that's what comes out on the script. People always think I'm not listening, but I am. Of course I'm listening. I'm just, you know, fast forwarding, I guess you'd call it. Thinking ahead, figuring out the tag, the ending. I've always got to have my ending first. Well, one ending, as it turned out, wasn't long in coming. Ruth Bunce and I lost our husband in April of 1965. Alan was, well, Alan was 16 years older than I was, so, you know, you think, well, he's probably going to go one day before you do, but I I never expected him to drop dead at 64. It was a blow. It was a huge blow for everyone, family, obviously. But he'd been my uh, acting partner since... 1944, you know. Well, Alan could certainly be exasperating at times and childish, and I didn't agree with his politics one whit, and I still have never gotten over the fact that he'd never read a book in his entire life, but, oh, God, I didn't just lose half my team. I lost a piece of my heart there, too. You know, I remember 
I remember when I'd cast him back in 1944, when Richard Widmark, nasty man, suddenly left the show. And all these letters came in to ABC, over 800 of them. There were complaining about my new Albert. And I'd written back to every single one saying, Jade, wait, 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 you'll just get used to him. And I promise you'll like him. Alan will be absolutely wonderful. And within a month, they'd all written back, bar one, I told you about that one, saying, you were right, Miss Lynch, we love Alan Bunce. Well, shortly after that, I remember we just finished rehearsal and we needed to get some autographs done for fans, photos, that sort of thing. And so I say, let's go down back to the apartment. I want to autograph some of the pictures down to get them sent out, I promised. And while I was done, I'm always signing my name and so forth. And I look up and Alan's standing at the mantelpiece. He's got his arm up on it. I said, come on, come on, get me. Guess you better get another Albert. What? I guess you better get another Albert. I told him, showed him the letters, showed him the answers. I had clipped each one. He looked at them. You saw how good he was. And he needed that. They all do. And there he was. He said, I guess you better get another Albert. I'm no good. Ah, oh, dear. Actors, what can you do? Alan was not just good. He was damn good at his job. Or he wouldn't have lasted with me so long, I'll tell you that. And I think over the years, he finally figured out his worth. I hope so. Of course, one of the sadder aspects about this kind of crummy business is that at the end of the day, all actors are replaceable. Here come the financial filberts, what a family. Funny, they always talk about money, but you have to agree. The financial filberts have money problems, just like you and me. Couldn't my family just once, just once be ready on time? I didn't I guess it's due any minute. Maybe the biggest deal of my life. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm coming, dear. Dinner is ready. Penny is combing her hair. She's always combing her hair. Either that or she's on the phone. Fourteen is a difficult age, darling. I and Billy is shaving. He's got three whiskers and he spends his Well, after the financial filberts, I think she did the capitalistic cashews, uh, or not? Not quite. What came next? Well, the rest of her life came next. Most of which she spent wandering the world and uh, eventually finding her way back to her first love, which was radio. And that's the next episode of The Private Life of Peg Lynch. The Private Life of Peg Lynch was written by Astrid King and produced by Alex King.